Welcome to DIA and to Readings in Contemporary Poetry. Uh, my name is Megan Whitco. I'm an assistant curator here at DIA, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. I'm also very pleased to welcome our two poets uh, for this evening, Sharon Mesmer and Wayne Kostenbaum. Thank you both for, for being here and for so generously agreeing to join our fall season. Uh, so Readings in Contemporary Poetry is a part of the Sackler Institute at DIA Art Foundation. And we want to um, extend our deep thanks to the Levy Gorvey Gallery, uh, who provides the major support for this series. And additional support is provided by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, as well as our media sponsor, the Brooklyn Rail. And we also, of course, want to thank uh, Brooklyn Brewery for the cold beverages uh, tonight. Uh, as well as all of Dia's staff who contribute to the series, and particularly Mary Catherine, Maria, Max, and Francesca. Uh, so following our first reader, we're going to take a brief intermission tonight, and uh, we'll have books for sale by both poets that time, uh, as well as you're welcome to grab another cold beverage if you'd like. And we'll also be selling uh, copies of a few Dia publications, uh, particularly our Artists on Artists series, as well as the newly published uh, Readings in Contemporary Poetry and Anthology, uh, which covers this series, uh, the years 2010 to 2016, um, when uh, Vincent uh, began curating it. So it is my pleasure now to welcome Vincent Katz, uh, the series curator up here, uh, who will introduce our first poet for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you all for coming. I'm on jury duty, so excuse me if I'm a little discombobulated tonight. But it's great to see so many of you here tonight, and it's going to be a great reading. I know that. I can guarantee it. Um, and I can guarantee that the next two readings are also going to be fantastic. We're having on November 14th, Jen Bourbon and Bernadette Mayer, and on December 5th, we're, we're happy to be hosting David Henderson and Andre Cadresco, so please come back. Sharon Mesmer is the author of Crossing Second Avenue, Half Angel, Half Lunch, Vertigo Seeks Affinities, Annoying Diabetic Bitch, The Virgin Formica, and Greetings from My Girly Leisure Place, which was published by Bloof Books in 2015. Her, her work has been anthologized numerous times, including in The Outlaw Bible of American Poetry and Postmodern American Poetry, a Norton Anthology. She is currently at work on a new collection of poems inspired by the lives and writings of 35 female poets of the Americas from the 19th century to modern times. She teaches at NYU and the New School and lives in New York City. I've been a fan of Sharon Mesmer's louche rants and murmurs since her Chicago days, and some of her poems and prose pieces from her 1998 collection, Half Angel, Half Lunch, its title a phrase from Ted Berrigan, have stayed with me ever since. Her poems can seem supercilious, but in fact, her imagery is mostly surrealist, with a beating human heart she keeps intact. Shifting slightly from the paradigm she establishes, Mesmer leaves the reader or listener to wallow in brightly lit insouciance with a pang of nostalgia. Quote, ample purple shadows between me and you, this heart a calm palmetto, grandly glamorous and tragic from her poem, The End. She's written a number of poems that needed to be written by someone, and she was the one who realized it. And we are grateful, such as the one that begins, it came to me suddenly, three dog night were really great, <laughs> from her poem, Just This. For Mesmer is one of our signal cultural salvagers, rarely a savager, only when necessary, a severer of false or outmoded memory to which she is particularly unforgiving. 
Her most recent poems have moved farther away from popular culture and personal history into a grander realm. The tone in these works plums the sublime. Here's the end of When the Moon Turned Away. Come on, look up, because I am still the moon and beautiful in the rear view mirror, like a woman, not salt bound, not sad, not a ghost caught crying, at least not that. Please welcome Sharon Mesmer to Dia. Thank you, Vincent. That was um, just uh, better than chocolate chip cookies, which I can't eat anyway, but that was I, not worthy. That was just so wonderful. Um, and thank you all for coming. I want to dedicate uh, my reading tonight to my former and current NYU and new school students who are here. Um, they took time out from their schedules to hear their old professor read. So thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to start with um, the poems from the new collection that Vincent mentioned, which is called Even Living Makes Me Die. And each poem is dedicated to, and some are written from the perspective of a woman poet of the Americas. Um, many of the 35 poets I've chosen are underknown. Uh, and were underknown in their lifetimes despite their um, prodigious creative output. Um, some poets like Delmira Agustini were alive in the 19th century. Um, some had their work uh, suppressed for political reasons and most of them were uh, visionary and really ahead of their time. Um, the t I'm going to read three poems from that collection, and um, two of them are probably are by poets that you probably recognize, um, Gabriela Mistral and Julia de Burgos. Um, but some poets in that collection um, you might not be familiar with. So um, this is from Even Living Makes Me Die, and it's called The Poet's Decalogue to Gabriela Mistral, 1889 to 1957. One. Be always conscious of your wings. Darkness is overtaking and even tension is tired. In the house of keeping still, all is hollow-eyed and groaning. Two, shiver and tingle outside the automobile. Grandma is on life support. The nuns and nurses found her and called you a wanderer. They know nothing of your wings, or do they? Three, Disrobe. The holiest were often required to be naked. Under the dome of the winged serpent, all was stillness. In those days, the sun door stood open, and all of creation flew through it in radiant rounds of joy. Four. Is your chimney warm? Is the air in it warm and the air in your room? Is your hearth redolent with the scent of flesh? If so, fan the flames to produce a cooling jewel. Use this jewel to scry only the most necessary knowing. Five, make a pilgrimage to the mountain of butterflies. Love descends on those defenseless. Six, the ocean-born virgin is nicknamed Fishy Smell, but her real name is Bird. Find her in the neck of time. Her vagina is enough. You don't need the legs. Remember that initiation takes a lifetime and transpires purely by accident. Soon, a triangle of morning light will come pouring through the porch. Seven. Take the mantle of an earth-colored insect, insect and make a wand with twigs and leaves. Use it to replicate the cunning beauty of certain corpses. In the end, your face should resemble a luminous apricot-colored cloud. Eight, soon you'll stall. Your coverts will beat to no advantage. You may choose to sacrifice your happiness to restore what was lost, but the sacrifice itself is a privilege. How long will it take you to forget this? Nine, 
Everything that torments and suffocates, everything that imparts sorrow and despair is the moving water that turns the wheel that transforms air into tree, into prayer, into air. Breathe deep. Make scribble pictures of the stain on your ceiling and try to sell them. Very few will buy. 10. Now recall the glory of your wings. And this is called, Anything in the Sky is Probably a Golden Human Woman with Kitten Hands. To Elizabeth Smart, Canada, 1913-1986. Cowboy little match girls, oracles of evening and caretakers of leaves, stalk the green grass in a red coral ring. Their destination, the plain heavyweight substance of keepsakes, a radiance which was once so bright. I hide from them, but they find me again, leaning on a mailbox, eating a green apple, advancing my own aims in shabby hand-me-downs. They find me again and set me on this path, and I must move, clutching my books of chance events and encounters, of euphemisms and taboos, my books made of bark. They were always at my heels, brandishing their souvenirs of the worst of the six afflictions, their memories of sharp-shinned birds. Once more, they force me to be the one living presence on the concourse, everyone else already dead. They speak with a voice of three antique maps. They are the ones to whom I am truly grateful. Together we push toward some foreign source of sacrifice, the lime of starfish in a Florida room. Together we climb the blue bones of a loathsome body overprotected by heavy flesh. This body is a portal to more azure paths, and finally we enter an immensity of sweaters. Here is where the plain heavyweight keepsakes fade. Here is where I lose the sky. Here is where they smile. Everything serves to further, they say. The millennium of sun is so unforgiving. This scattered array of constellations crawling with the stink of saints. Probably the earliest universe was nothing more than a fly swatter made of dirt and nectarines with a massive set of jaws and teeth that sprouted around gills. Anything in the sky was probably a golden human woman with kitten hands. Here is where I lose that sky. There is no finish line, no loving cup, no body crown, no banners waving from a balustrade. Here is where I say goodbye, a blur of feathered epaulets. Here is my dinner of lizards. These bells, just televisions in the mist. And um, this is the third one and last one from that collection. It's called Over Time's Furrow Flying, and it's to Julia de Burgos, Puerto Rico, 1917 to 1953. This poem was not written by you, Sharon Mesmer, white woman whose name means complainer of insomnia. <laughs> this poem was written by me, Julia de Burgos, whose name means my eyes are filled with the graves of stars, and that's why I can fly. Who am I? Don't you know me? Well, when God asked me who I wanted to be, and I said, someone who loves peacefully, God wrote down amnesiac and pushed me out of baby heaven, like a blank pushes a blank out of a blank. Fill in the blank, Sharon Mesmer. I've already done all the work. What, you're still wondering how I got inside? Still wondering why only one of us can fly? Well, keep in mind that when you write a line like, no one loved me but I had wings, we both know you're trying to sound like Mary Oliver. I know because I never tried to write myself into a position involving career advancement or even happiness. I am no mere witness to inertia. I know that heaven kills and hell transforms a witness to inertia into an embodied form of joy for all eternity. At the same time, I'm no angel. I'm not even a filthy pigeon. What am I then? 
I am the scaled fish writhing, still alive in your hands, my wild eyes pleading with you to blank. You know what to do. Start feeling the constrictions of your sticky wings. And um, these next two poems are from the beautiful book that Shanna Compton did for me, um, Greetings from My Girly Leisure Place from Bluff Books that came out in um, 2015. I am now bringing everything to the path. Working class, ethnic, unemployable, and obscure, I am the Polish church in anguish. And that's why I am now bringing everything to the path. Granted, my girly leisure place YouTube video is ludicrous, but no matter where you are, chances are you can crack a window and hear a cow moo, a cow who is bringing everything to the path too. I am bringing my famous see-through green glass typewriter with its trademark of illegal firearms in curlicue scraffito Italian style on the space bar to the path, plus eating my seed concoctions with a spoon and secretly looking for a path with fruit. Some semioticians say that all those Elvis sightings suggest the atavistic power of the Dionysus myth in the human psyche, but I say that's just Elvis, bringing improved spatial orientation to the path as he dances flat-footed with arms raised and palms held flat in a sea-green merkin and curled Grecian wig complete with a wreath of gleaming copper grapes. The path, he says, is not manufactured, the path just is, thus to my art. <laughs> thus to my own personal path, to which I am now bringing extraordinary contortions, including a sort of sideways hopscotch interrupted by a few seconds of statuesque immobility on one foot, as I descend from a nest of shit flies who are reproducing in a festooned silver circle. But where is Jesus Christ in all this? Uh, did you know I'm bringing Jesus to the path too? Because I once had a professor who said it was high time to bring everything together in one killer Jesus. On the other hand, your Jesus friends who want to bring actual killers to the path should probably just stay home. You say Hollywood whispered your name and said, why don't you bring your big ass on over to the path? I say you are living on one of the moons of Harry Connick Jr., but that's okay, because once you start bringing that big ass on over to the path, the path itself is going to be bringing it. I lost my beatnik antlers on the grassy knoll. Help me, JFK. I lost my khakis and my hair smoosh and my craft beer Telly Savala shrine. I lost my history of maple urine disease on the grassy knoll and my trainable kielbasa. I lost my eatable narc pants. I was told I had lost my reason. I lost my A-Rod beanstick mojo on the grassy knoll, but I found my Christmas spliff. Scully, Mulder, I will be a doctor. But I need my Ryan Seacrest as a kitty blanket first. Cuba has Santeria, Haiti has voodoo, and I have my Abraham Lincoln's birthday does Irish cheerleaders at Madison Square Garden Pass. Oops, had. Jean Valjean's balls are on the rebound from Napoleon, but don't look for them on the grassy knoll. Also lost are Broadway memories of, Broadway memories of Sylvia Plath and Rachel Ray's My Little E-Pony giveaway. I hear Maytag refrigerators are polling the elephant man's spider bite about Tom of Finland's minimum wage petition. Apparently, it's also gone missing on the grassy knoll. Now I don't feel so alone. Russell Crowe's Peanut Corporation is also lost, as well as Canadian television's Why Do I Have Green Poop NASCAR series. Too bad about Neil Patrick Harris's Spanglish movie, Wampum the Sky Warrior, and Wampum Reloaded, Zombie Apocalypse Credit Union. Whatever happened to Marie Osmond's Deluxe Dead Baby Pills patch, and Freak Out on Lesbian Mountain, starring groundhog puppets and sponsored by Abilify? And where are Hosni Mubarak's pics of America's most voluptuous MILF members of the Loyal Order of Benevolent Toilet Dogs? I think we know the answer. 
my live sponge birth control pay-per-view, my prednisone-induced diarrhea tracking number, my cat's resignation letter to Maya Angelou's Power Rangers Diaper Lover Stories Night. Help me, JFK. <laughs> okay, now I'm going into the vault. How am I doing on time? Okay, gate signatures for David Amram. Enduring freedom just turned a corner, like a picnic interloper skilled in shindig, like a diving bird with notes of ivory alive within a century of throats, like an insouciant suitor oozing chutzpah in vast trajectories of tongue-tied sounds, like a soprano of the flesh on two continents, or the monumental ice in Stuttgart's luxurious seaport, and while Monroe enjoys gulag maneuvers, Andean sun worshippers plunder Iona's etoile moguls, supplementing splendor with parched aspects of the sea of tranquility, like the NFL made peevish by female roughnecks seeking Bowery derelicts, London rubbernecks and gung-ho pillows in a wilderness of buckwheat mush to form the center of an arty party's endless source of energy. Like a pagan blunderbuss at home with a drone's next hoax, like a star in the axle of the ear, like a nimbus portal, like a princess with a vinous touch, translating the lemming's inquiry into stammering oriental specificity, like products of asexual reproduction in Wisconsin, thespians of unusually heavy youth, brainstorming the abbess, the gardener's adobe hoe, and her peculiar food regimen, like an escapade of neck feathers, a case of lucky legs, a bohemian deemed seamy and cowboy argot, and, oh, unsightly cuckoo, my impossible dream times 13. What happens when happiness comes first? It's negligent candor like a zeitgeist anchored by a famous refrain about free agency, like sleeping pills in lieu of food, like the happy vignettes of that's entertainment, as uncertain thresholds as gate signatures, as alternative means of transport, like eating bad food and candy or goofing on Jimmy Durante, in ways that impose order and meaning on actions, as mundane and comforting as washing cups at sunset, then walking alone, slowly, in the long twilight, wrapped in a blanket, in a way that apes the ancient regularity of nature. Okay. Two more is good? Two more? Okay. Uh, don't tell me that, because I'll be up here for hours. Um, this is a poem... Um, I was commissioned uh, to write a poem for the uh, radio show This American Life by my friend Sean Cole. And my um, instruction was that I had to be neutral. Uh, I wrote a poem, they didn't take it. I got paid very generously, so that was really great, but it wasn't neutral enough. But then I also wrote this other poem that sort of conveyed really kind of more of what I felt about it. Um, it's called Turning to Light, and it has an epigram, and the epigram is, a student asked, when times of great difficulty visit us, how should we meet them? The teacher said, welcome. Welcome subsiding of light. Welcome turning of the year. Welcome unexpected conclusion, abyss divulging its form. Welcome darkness that is another sun. Welcome all we are about to lose. Welcome all we are about to gain. Welcome with sitting with all that is difficult. Welcome no thoughts. Welcome many thoughts. Welcome wound that never heals. Welcome event horizon where familiar things disappear. Welcome age of chaos. Welcome loss of words. In a little while, there will be many. Welcome no words, welcome the many words. Welcome all-consuming weariness. Welcome familiar joys tinged with bitterness. Welcome reversal. Welcome moment when something new appears. Welcome unknown frontier that forces us to become more than we ever were before. 
Welcome turning all mishaps into the path. Welcome driving all blames into one. Welcome being grateful to everyone. Welcome new poem written quickly wherein I say, welcome new future of which I am not afraid for I have already looked into that abyss and I am prepared for light. Welcome returning of light. Welcome turning, turning, turning to light. And um, I'm going to read two more. Is that okay? <laughs> See, I'm going to sneak one in there. Um, this is to Allie Warren, and it's called Build This Chariot. It's short. Build this chariot. Build it now. Build it with a syrinx redolent of poppers. Build it by flooding the continental hem with vino tinto and bacalao. Flood it now. Flood it with shredded clinic morsels in a basket appropriated from its original clock out function as you clock out shredding, shredding now. Your name is Cloud. You farm a cow in fields rife with horses. You wipe your mouth a lot. You cup. You run hard. Go long with hits in a wild west, giggling and ratcheting and releasing weevils built of bricks. Thick set and generous, your brick nuts activate the nuts inside my woodwork, which I dap beside you. I dap there now. Because I aim to come correct, siphon the derelict chamber with looting as I lope, because it's a perimeter, it's a mitzvah, when building strips come incessant with bulbs and strange waiting and building and more building. And we together build this chariot, build it strong and strange with necks and squeaks and Flood it with shredded clinic morsels. We build this chariot. We build it now. And the last poem I'm going to read is called My Juice. I'm holding my juice, holding my cleanliness. I'm holding my juice in my cleanliness with my spiders, my release, my virginity, and forgiveness. I'm covering you with love in the guise of my juice while cowering in the face of so much confusion. My cleanliness becomes a contusion and now I'm withholding my juice, withholding my contusion. I'm withholding my juice in my contusion with my starlight, my dark ages, my dust ruffles and Bibles and vicious bird foibles in my crawl space. In the absence of juice, a crowd of consorts stinks up my crawl space, and I feel my way blindly toward the Holy of Holies, an old plastic bag wound round a branch, torn and tattered like an old cocoon, where I receive communion in the form of my juice. And now I'm upholding my juice, upholding my communion, upholding my juice in my communion, avoiding the brightly lit palaces for the twilight interstices between Venus and Lucifer, in the coalescence of debris that made the moon, to touch with my most febrile feeler, my most precious, and at the same time, insecure possession. Thank you all so much. Wayne Kestenbaum is the author of the following books of poetry. Ode to Anna Malfo and Other Poems, Rhapsodies of a Repeat Offender, The Milk of Inquiry, Model Homes, Best-Selling Jewish Porn Films, Blue Stranger with Mosaic Background, and The Pink Trance Notebooks, published by Nightboat Books in 2015. In addition, he is the author of numerous works of cultural criticism, including The Queen's Throat, Opera, Homosexuality, and the Mystery of Desire, Jackie Under My Skin, Interpreting an Icon, Cleavage, Essays on Sex, Stars, and Aesthetics, Andy Warhol, Humiliation, that's another title, it's not, it's not Andy Warhol, colon. <laughs> it's Andy Warhol, and also Humiliation, the Anatomy of Harpo Marx, My 1980s and Other Essays, and Notes on Glaze. He's also the author of two works of fiction and an opera libretto. His first piano vocal record, Lounge Act, was released by Ugly Duckling Press this year. 
He is the Distinguished Professor of English, Comparative Literature, and French at CUNY Grad Center. Wayne Kestenbaum's poetry has evolved from his early, athletically formal, highly wrought stanzas to his most recent, almost disintegrating daily fragments. In between, in his characteristically energetic way, he's tackled many modes in series of insight and delight. It is, in fact, important to consider Wayne's entire output as writer, musician, and painter when thinking about his poetry, in that it all evidences an intense ambition, a desire, one wants to say, that only these particular forms can give voice to. His poem, Diva Atonement Tour, from his 2006 collection, Best Selling Jewish Porn Films, gives a sense of his habitual approach, or should I say, response, or both. Wayne, the poet, often, often pictures himself as Wayne, the performer, and vice versa, I would imagine. His name is up in lights. He takes the stage. The poem writes itself. Uh, quote, I'm having a devilish time controlling my body's two gods, theatrical, tutelary. Wayne is on stage and also under observation in these poems that not only reference opera and other forms of hysterical virtuosity, but actually embody them. This is no small feat. I mean that Wayne, through his devotion to obsession, his elevation of perversion, has done what few others have even thought of attempting. He's made classical music hip again. Of course, there's much more. Two little elegies for Joe Brainerd, for example. But even that poem contains the lines, at the great soprano's husband's funeral, the synagogue smells of talc and hair oil. It's as though Wayne can't control himself, and we are the beneficiaries. With great, what's the word, compulsive, tormented, pathological, attention to form and detail, Wayne simultaneously abandons himself to his darkest, most wayward whims. He's got his Apollonian and Dionysian in perfect sync. Let's see where he notches it up tonight. Please join me in welcoming Wayne Kestenbauer. Heaven, thank you, Vincent. I really feel blessed. That was um, a, just astonishingly, astonishingly gratifying to hear on every level. Mm. And Sharon, as I said to you, one on one, that was a perfect reading. Yeah. Really, you broadcast it, and with with enviable lucidity and and presence. So, cheers. I'm gonna read just pretty much, I think, just new stuff tonight. Um, first, I wanna read a little thing that is, in, that is technically in prose from a book I'm working on of parables, allegories, poetic fictions that are really about now because I found after the abomination in chief entered public consciousness in October in that kind of a way. Like everybody else, there was a certain, uh, there were scenes of reckoning at the writer's table of, you know, just whatever. I don't want to moralize about that. But I, I will note that around that time I started writing these little allegories. And I think it was really, it, it seemed a kind of Valser or Kafka-like flight into fable, but it also seemed to me my best method of understanding the new recalibrations of fiction and fact in which we were drowning. So um, most of these are written in response to works of art, occasioned by those. Um, this one isn't. It's called Mayoral Chandelier. The chandelier in the mayor's dining room was insufficiently mayoral, an insufficiency that displeased the mayor's father, 
who had bestowed upon his only son this gilded chandelier as a symbol of the civic crotch that the son must now nurse to maturity. The chandelier had no say in the matter. The chandelier, more bisexual than most lamp fixtures, cared for neither civics nor degeneration. Degeneration would be the fate of the civic crotch if the indifferent chandelier did not step up to bat by mitigating its own brilliancy, by deciding to grow dim at accustomed hours, and by desiring the civic crotch and thus preventing the mayor from pox. Pox awaited the mayor if his father didn't rise from narcoleptic coma and aid the chandelier in limiting its illumination. In this dining room, before coma had incapacitated the mayor's father, the two would often sit over postprandials and bash the populace through slur and banter. I was sometimes present at these colloquies under the watchful light of a chandelier whose function the apothecary and the plumber had grown to doubt. I never doubted the chandelier. I was its staunch defender, its medicator. I applied grease and toothpick to the crevices within the chandelier's unseen foundations, where the chandelier ceased to be entirely a chandelier and began to resemble a grotto within Paris's honeycombed sewers. Because my affair with the mayor's father had offended the newspaper's editorial staff, I had no choice but to lubricate the chandelier and to sit on lucky evenings with the mayoral père et fils to contemplate the wreckage of the town asleep around us, a town already so afflicted with caries and rot that soon we would have no cabinet, no police, no mansion, and no chandelier. Meanwhile, the mayor wrote his speeches under the glaucous pools of light the chandelier sent downward in its quest to be an ambassador of civility. Nine limbs had the chandelier. The mayor and I would soon bury the father, burn his papers, and try to forget the red boat he long ago rowed on the village's lake. A lithograph of this boat sold last night at Sotheby's. After, after the sale, the victorious purchaser celebrated her triumph at a tapas bar where the portions were criminally meager. <laughs> I won't ask you to unpiece the allegory, but I think you get it. <laughs> okay, now for the bulk of, probably for the rest of the reading, I'm going to read from a book that is coming out from Nightboat Books in March 2018. It's the sequel to The Pink Trance Notebooks, which came out in 2015. It's a part two of a, of a projected trilogy, a trance trilogy, all based on um, notebooks that I keep. And so uh, The Pink Trance Notebooks was my notebooks from 2013, much edited, and Camp Marmalade, which is the title of volume two, so it will be orange. Camp Marmalade is my journals from 2014. And I'm working now on volume three, which is the journals from 2015, 16, and 17. Cram them in, hence marmalade. Make a confit of time. So these are about, these are a little lengthy and I'm just going to, they, they just go. I'm going to read like four of them. Number 33, subtitled, Why All, must, Why All Musicians Must Be Lonely. Elizabeth Bishop lived in reach of Key West Graveyard. Yes, V would let me worship his ass in stirrups if I could stage it without revealing my pallor. Mistral the poet? and mistral the wind, room devoted to mother's arms, terror, and value. Half dead, we claim likeness to full life. After Elsa Lasker Schuler was beaten up, she emigrated to Palestine, buried on Mount of Olives. 
defined and harnessed by my mouth's ugliness, as seen in college by Caroline Kennedy's hypothesized gaze. Anna Maffo's audition for Sound of Music, 1963, heard today for the first time, plus Austerlitz, harpsichord accompanied schlocky theme song like Morton Feldman tickled in dark silent room. Mother's tuna sandwich and Stickney's darkness where pie racks shone, bathroom corridors, lucky strike, and Paul Mall machines. Sitting in Miltonic lavatory for solitude and ease, Felix Culpa tea room. Wish I'd doubled glory hole usage, pre-AIDS varieties of religious jouissance. Was mother's friend Margie my art savior? Nut-faced Margie with mother after Macy's excursion, examining purchases laid out on master bed. Living room bridge mix with neighbor Gladys. Dread of night, dread of not night, Kafka said. Weight of drinking and weight of years of not drinking, Elizabeth Hardwick said. Father Xerox's Keats ode on Christmas as excuse to exit house and use payphone to call mistress. Papa didn't watch Marriage Italian style, but I did, and now I write rather than chat about normality's intersections with Simone de Beauvoir. Please read Arendt's totalitarianism alongside Trockel's poems to discern why villagers are doxa or crowd consciousness. L.A. Frankfurt School remake, Schoenberg's How One Becomes Lonely. Breakfast roll in Adorno's mouth as he asks about global warming. <laughs> Tap dancer Bunny Briggs died. Mark Strand died. Monday, two weeks ago, saw him walk feebly down hall, didn't say hello, never again a chance to say hello to Mark Strand. Mother on hunger strike, preparing fruit sauce to accompany cup custards. Eve, in dream, said, I have problems. Bathroom stall not completely closed in Hulderlin Tower, pale next to law school. He is too skinny now. Skinniness removes abjection. Maybe devote December to sexual hypomania. For what purpose? To prove death's distance? Paralyze death's wish to claim me prematurely? Mafo agreed to be part of documentary. I'd meet her for the first time, and Henry would film the encounter. She died, and the meeting never happened. Before speech failed her, Eve praised me in dream. Long, awkward silence, and then three last words. I have problems. Her complex syntax eclipsed by sickness. Someone's mother hugged me as if I were, for a moment, a plausible cardboard fake son. Was mother's voice dodecaphonic? Dream, saw live Vivian Lay test streetcar. Reading the script for the first time opposite a young Marlon Brando who resembled Paul Lind, cast against type. I tried to tell Vivian how sublime her Blanche was going to be, impossible to communicate her future magnificence. Looked at back of her calves, connected to drowning in dark green water, back bay, my advocacy of Hardwick's velvet prose. May Rooker says a writer must read for at least 10 hours a day. Photos of May Rooker, hermit, surrounded by stacks of books. Guibert's diary of going blind. Oates's them, hardcover, vanguard press, as Nirvana mana eruption, like Lawrence's the fox leading to death scene. At market, I first, at, at market, at first I ignored bok choy then decided to buy it. No one else was paying attention to bok choy. <laughs> okay, here's another one. A drop shorter. 19, subtitled, Imaginary Baby Lunching on His Own Oblivion. <laughs> Jury duty taught me how to speak German. 
right to exorcise like Kafka shutting his eyes. Come video jammed, distrusted size of jet. Down to 126 pounds, two desserts at lunch. Stop drinking temporarily. Diaspora from self began when she borrowed my women in love and wrote her notes on it but got the professor's name wrong. Research my fetus and see if it's viable, my theoretical fetus. Dead person too has fetus, is fetus. Lenny Bruce, dead. Leonard Cohen's, not dead. Two nipples is what we expect. I found two nipples and was relieved. Fido, Dido, t-shirt in spring, I recall you, seeming to redeem cartoon attitudes as revolt against early death from named or unnamed disease. I bought Raymond Dragon t-shirts and shorts without knowing that Raymond Dragon was a porn star. Thread voice montage. Chantal Ackerman taught at City College. Stuck leaf blocked by father liturgy like Joan Rivers in The Swimmer with nude Burt Lancaster, or like when my father went into raptures over Dante at dinner before Pesto, beyond abstraction, or Polk Street, where s and was long ago touchstone, never experienced, but bare posited. Polo cologne for my boyfriend's birthday, though by then he transcended polo. My belief in continuous motion versus his belief in control and precision. Why bother is anyone's response to Sibylline labors, and yet I treasure unflaggingness. Study him, V of shirt neck frozen there, snapshot of his indifference and tact. The ocean floats unsupervised, as if the ocean didn't have a mother. Vincent Price starred in three early scary, trashy movies I saw at Fox Theater downtown. Sleaze matinee near smoke shop I could never enter, but now I see its visage. Mountainous smoke shop more tangible than the mind conjecturing you. Poached egg on toast from mother when I was sick and I was often sick. That grass, too, has its heft and weave. Gigue and Courant memorized. To be inspired by nude models in the room when you write. Posing nude in a kindergarten's vicinity, not illegal. <laughs> People in the US never shut up. Take away either their money or their loud voices. Yes becomes her way to substitute violin for Spinoza scapegoating in Baltimore on Baltimore train platform where dead man flashed VD penis at me. If I can't say her insane arms, why keep a notebook? Imaginary baby lunching on his own oblivion. Two secretaries and four people, she says. Aren't secretaries people too? He loved my double, but why didn't he realize that I was the double and give me the voluptuous attentions he gave my twin? We disapprove of rhetoric, but Duncan Smith discovered voltage in Norma equals no arm. Norma Desmond of Sunset Boulevard, according to Duncan Smith, is rhetorically missing an arm. The internet is everybody's mother. Sideburns agency meets Jaws rebuttal like Eucharist in anarchist mouth at thorn-crowned rest stop diner. If his arms are cute and nude, he must be gay. Voice is precise and withholds aggression, and so is gay. Change gayness oil, dipstick to replenish or thwart gayness, because gayness, he told me, is dead, like sacred library text fruit, not preserved, before it spoils. In case I chicken out of the fourth, I'm gonna reverse the order. So here's um, number 27, <clears throat> subtitled A Smelly Him, H-I-M capitalized, we saluted by saying or eating port salute. Gwyneth Paltrow complimented my jacket. This isn't a dream. 
We crossed paths on a theater staircase. She said, I love your jacket. Sing four, sing A four times with husky monotone. Three idiosyncratic hairs in arm crook. I thought they were error squiggles. Tanta Elisa's favorite cheese was Port Salute. Was Port Salute a seaport like Port Washington? Was Port Salute a way of treasuring the other by saluting it or him? Maybe Salute was him, and we saluted him by saying Port Salute, a smelly him we saluted by saying or eating Port Salute. He rejects me like a dead body rejecting air and earth. Wanted to suck his elbow, write a review of his elbow. Ionic volute hair, thrice paranoid, reassessed in theater bathroom. Sing Strauss and then die. Sing unmonumental Bellini song perfectly and die unvisited. On the verge of fainting before opening night curtain rises. Inebriate rediscovery of rubato live mafo amami Alfredo opposite Domingo, 1970. Dickinson said Domingo in a phrase I misremember as finer than Domingo or a Domingo never brewed. They laugh at the space between my legs. Widener Library named after a drowned man. Books intersect with drowning because Prospero drowns his book. Did D.H. Lawrence write drowned books? Ginsburg capsule, his art in a pillbox, memory crumbs in 24-hour slow dose. Restaur restaurateur at the Center for Queer Happiness, I serve buckwheat batter existentialism assoluta. <laughs> she cut up her book in a Reuben sandwich club formation. Scholarly quiet man hasn't shaved in two days. Stubble darkened face contrasting with light colored shoes turned him into my art piece or art to cool. Stubble envy began with a big bang. Gay boys in sleazy harbor bar picked me up for gender and poetry, Marxist anarchist lessons. But after a few minutes of considering me the central attraction, they lost interest and began deriding. Strung out odalisque hipster continuo on bed. Cruel gay wine bar in Villefranche-sur-Brooklyn. An angry male proprietor blankness where I expected a maitre d'. Committed to phrenology's afterlife, taking obscene photos of isolated sentences. He played an unlikable character with bushy beard. After the movie, I told him, you're much handsomer in person. But he was not my Sanka overdosing logician. Somebody nun-like blessed the pus and flattered it. Just bite his elbow and be done with it, even if I fail the team and, and am accused of being indelicate. That's it for tonight. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>